Chapter 25 The sound of Malachi ranting on stage had been dull and distant behind the thin walls of the trailer. Also distant was the growing gravitational force of the pull as the very last of my alcoholic brain sludge sobered up. When the trailer started moving, Beckett's emotional state was something akin to a tornado in a trailer park. I did my best to focus on Corey and the moving trailer, but ignoring Beckett was like trying to ignore a volcano erupting a dozen yards behind your back. By the time the trailer stopped and the door swung open, Malachi's voice had become clear. The simmering cacophony of rage from the rally had risen to a boil. Thousands of invisible piano wires pricked at me until my skin had gone numb from the psychic touch. The fog of emotional overload had crept into my brain without me even noticing it. And when the door swung open, spilling bright, artificial stage lights into the trailer, my vision swam in twisting waves. The light washed inside, carrying with it the unchecked hatred of hundreds of white supremacists. It is time, brother, Malachi said from somewhere beyond the trailer, his voice amplified by those blaring speakers. I looked from Corey to Beckett. He looked like he was about to shit his pants. Again. Stay in here, kid, I said, grabbing at the counter to steady myself against the spinning room. M -m Mr. Owens. Ah, fuck it, Corey snapped. She pushed past me, grabbed my wrist, and pulled me to the door. Like a dog on a leash, and feeling just about as useless, the harder I struggled against the emotional pressure. Fuck, I needed way more alcohol. I was led through the trailer door, and down the steps. My vision swirled and blurred from the movement, as a baby migraine began thumping against the inside of my skull. I caught a glimpse of Corey grinning proudly, turning in a dramatic circle, and curtsying for the crowd. Malachi had been patched up and redressed since Valdez hit him with my truck at the library. He somehow looked larger than life, a Bible in his hands and a solemn expression masking the evil I felt pulsing from him in cataclysmic waves. The ground shifted under my feet, or maybe the pole was turning my world upside down, and I stumbled dropping to a knee and bracing a fist against the stage. The stage. Under the band shell. I craned my neck to look over my shoulder at the trailer. It had been the one trailer hitched to a truck. A vehicle ramp had been assembled behind the stage. That was the incline I felt when the trailer started moving. The higher functions in my brain were grinding to a painful halt, as the external pressure of emotions and the internal pressure in my head reached excruciating levels. My Play-Doh brains were quickly becoming dried out and crumbly, but one inescapable truth remained clear. They set me up, right from the very start, before Beckett even showed up at my door. Getting me right here on this stage had always been the plan. And I really needed a fucking drink. Little brother! Malachi said, his voice singular and small in front of me, while simultaneously booming all around me. I told you, I warned you, Jesus needs to hear you repent. Your soul needs it. Your wife demands it. Eternal damnation awaits if you refuse. Malachi pivoted to address the crowd of Nazi fucks. Through the bright stage lights and my swimming vision, I could see that, in the dark of the night, tiki torches, that fresh fucked up symbol of alt-right hate, had been lit, and blazing points of light now dotted the park. If these were the angry villagers, surely I was meant to be the monster. A new chant was gathering steam. Fuck him up! Fuck him up! Fuck him up! Malachi spoke loudly to the rally. There are those here who think that, for Abraham Owens, the unbreakable strong arm of St. Charles City, there are those of you who believe his die is cast 
and his fate sealed. And you are right, my own brother. I called him Little Baby Amy when we were kids. He has lived a life of unrepentant sin and try as I might to show him the path to lead him to the water. Malachi squatted beside me and placed a firm hand on the back of my neck. Like the stubborn mule he really is, he refuses to drink. He turned to me, and I could feel his breath on my face. At least it was something to focus on. If only I could fucking focus. Jesus forgives, little brother, Malachi whispered, speakers blaring. But first you must repent. Damnation is not inevitable. No matter the sin, no matter the transgression, Jesus will forgive. But he needs you to beg for it. Malachi rose to his feet and spoke loudly again, driving a railroad spike of pain through my head. Show these people the power of salvation! Beg for redemption! Repent your sins! Save yourself from damnation so that we might join hands and embrace a golden future side by side as brothers in Christ, as brothers in blood, as brothers in purpose. Malachi pivoted on the stage and stretched his hand out to me. Brother Abraham, his voice boomed. Do you beg for redemption in the eyes of your Lord and Savior, in the eyes of your wife, and in the presence of the sons of our homeland? My hand slipped from my knee and hit the ground. My jaw clenched, muscles straining and spasming. I couldn't see straight, I couldn't think straight, and I desperately needed to get the fuck off this fucking stage. But what about Beckett? What about, fuck, 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 what about, what about, what about, what about, what about, what about? The anger, the rage, it was all I could feel. Josephine silently berated me. Never succumb to the anger, never lose yourself to the rage. If you do, you'll never be better than they are. Well, maybe I'm not any better than these fuckwits. Of course you are. Then why couldn't I repent? I fucked up. I left her to die. Why couldn't I just fucking admit it? Why couldn't I beg for Gertie's forgiveness? Josephine's silent voice had an answer for that one, too. That guilt you're clutching so tightly. That guilt that's been chewing away at your insides for all these years. Gertie's dead and gone, Abe. And there isn't a whole lot of anything she's capable of forgiving. So maybe you don't want forgiveness so much as you want to keep holding on to that guilt, clutching it tightly because that's the last damn thing you have left. That guilt isn't because of Gertie. It is Gertie. And giving up that last bit of her would just about kill you now, wouldn't it? Little baby Amy, Malachi said to me yanking whatever consciousness I had away from Josephine's voice. What do you say? Will you step into the light with me? I looked up from the stage floor, blurred vision focused long enough to see him literally standing in the circle of a spotlight, hand stretched out to me, welcoming, encouraging, brotherly. And yet, like a goddamn forest fire, the anger blazed. Jesus saves the sinners, especially the white ones, because Jesus was white, never you mind. The whites are the chosen people. The whites have been blessed by God, and God wants you to save up your jizz, listen to his lies, and be a good, useful idiot. Brother Abraham, Malachi said softly, your time is running out. This is an exploding offer. Only I can save you. Call now, repent, and get rich quick while you're at it. With an impossible effort, straining every muscle beyond its max, I pushed myself to my feet. Legs wobbled, and my heart thumped furiously. 
I locked eyes with Malachi and gave voice to the only words I could manage to push out of my mouth. Fuck. Off. The corner of his mouth lifted. He turned to the crowd and spread his arms wide. The die is cast. Without so much as a glance back at me, Malachi took a running leap off the stage and disappeared into the rally. The crowd waved their tiki torches, whooping and hollering and yelling at me, although I couldn't for the life of me make out a single word. It was a full-on assault to my senses, including that fucked-up, psychic, sixth sense. I staggered back a half-step, a dull buzz filling my ears, and I wondered what could possibly happen next. Hello, Abraham. The voice was soft and subdued, even over the speaker arrays. My head spun around, searching for the source of the new voice. In a blurred daze, I saw Corey on the steps of the trailer, head lolling back and laughing. I saw Beckett's wide eyes peeking through a trailer window. I saw Councilman White standing off in a wing, frowning something sour and surrounded by armed militants. And there, in the opposite wing, on the other side of the stage, a figure stepped out of the shadows. The buzzing in my ears drowned out the noise of the world around me, but her words were clear as day. Hello, Abraham. The earth went sideways, and I stumbled again. It wasn't possible, but her face was right there. I recognized the shape, the curves. It was getting closer to me with every deliberate step she took. And no matter how much I blinked to focus my vision, there was no mistaking it. My mouth felt like sandpaper. When I finally spoke, my voice sounded foreign to my own ears, like it was clawing its way out of a gravel pit. G Gertie!